Welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Toran Jigazarian. She, her pronouns. I am the founding artistic director emeritus of Golden Thread Productions and a founding board member of MENA Theatre Makers Alliance. Very happy to be here with you. Uh, if you are just tuning in, this is session number six of the 24 Hours for Palestine. I'm speaking with you from Oakland, California, the land of Chochechnyo Olona people. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, it is home to one of the largest intertribal indigenous communities in the U.S. that continues to reclaim and preserve land and to revive indigenous culture. Um, the session's titled From Cars to Gaza. Uh, the title draws a connection between the Armenian genocide in 1915 and the current events in Gaza. For those who may not know, in the first two decades of the 20th century, over one and a half million Armenians were killed or displaced from their ancestral homes in Armenia. This genocide committed by the Ottoman Empire and the Young Turks government has not yet been formally acknowledged by the Turkish government. Uh, but for Armenians, the wounds are not historic only, as recently as September 2023, last year. Uh, 100,000 Armenians were displaced by the Azeri military from Nagorno-Karabakh. Both Turkey and Azerbaijan are major uh, strategic regional partners of the U.S., and while the U.S. pays lip service to Armenians, it has not taken any concrete steps to stop Turkish or Azeri aggression against Armenians. To recap, the overarching question in this panel is, as Armenians, how does this history of the Armenian genocide and the politics surrounding it inform our under understanding and response to the atrocities in Gaza? We'll hear from four amazing Armenians, Rafi Vartanian, poet and performer, Oji Geretsian, community builder, Sevan, playwright and performer, and Nancy Agabian, author. In terms of our panel format, just so everyone knows, I'll ask our panelists to speak one at a time for about five minutes to introduce themselves and briefly describe their personal history of the Armenian genocide and their, their response to what is happening in Palestine. After the panelists' introductory remarks, we'll continue with follow-up questions from the panelists and a group conversation. I will begin with you, Nancy, if you would start us off. And I know, for example, that you organized the Pal Palestinian Solidarity event last November. So if you would talk about that briefly as well. Thank you, Nancy. Sure. Thank you so much, Taranj. Thank you so much, Golden Threads, and all the many partners for organizing this vital event. I'm very honored to be here. So, yes, I am a writer. And I am going to read my introduction because I feel more comfortable that way. Um, so um, I'm in southeastern Massachusetts, lands of the Poconocet, the original name of the Wampanoag people before colonists out loud saying their name. They have a 10,000 year history here before colonizers arrived in the 1660s. Um, and as Taranj said, I'm a writer and I'm a longtime LGBTQ Armenian activist. My memoir, Me Is Her Again, sets my queer coming of age within my Armenian American family history, reckoning with intergenerational trauma of my paternal grandmother's survival of the Armenian genocide. So in 1915, she was a 10-year-old child living in East Anos, a village in Sipastia, now known as Sivas in Turkey, when her father was arrested and killed and the rest of her family was forced on a death march hundreds of miles to Derzor. She lost her mother and siblings along the way. And I was my grandmother's youngest grandchild, and I felt a very strong bond and love from her until she died when I was 25. 
I think it was my child self that she felt safe with, even as I know she must have been triggered and traumatized countless times as she raised five children. She likely gave birth to her first child when she was still a teenager. So as I watched Sesame Street, she would shyly practice writing the alphabet because she was never formally schooled. Sometimes she told me her survival story spontaneously, asking how I'd like to experience what she had, as if speaking to someone else. She also cooked amazing food, constantly imploring me to eat more. When she bathed me, it was with great intention and care. Now it's the children of Gaza that I keep seeing in my grandmother and my grandmother in the children as I watch on Instagram countless images that I never imagined in my life. Children repeatedly torn apart, shaking with trauma, begging for help, screaming for justice, acting as vendors, carrying a beloved pet or toy from place to place, surviving as little grown-ups and sometimes finding moments to play. Americans are encouraged constantly to forget history through addiction, entertainment, and our very culture of work, 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 work to achieve a dubious dream. I find myself as an American falling into these patterns. But it's my grandmother's memory that won't let me forget. So um, as Taranj mentioned in December, Mashinka Firots, Hakopian, and I organized an online reading called Who Remembers, uh, the title after a Najwan Darwish poem, Who Remembers the Armenians. Um, so it was a Palestinian-Armenian solidarity reading. It featured both Armenian and Palestinian poets reading their work. And it was sponsored by the International Armenian Literary Alliance, also known as YALA, and co-hosted by a number of other orgs, including Palfest, Rawi, Mizna, Waywag, etc., serving as a fundraiser for PAL Legal and All for Armenia. You can find it on YouTube and Swana Region Radio on KPFK's archives and Spotify channel. And I'll say it was a very moving um, and necessary event at the time. In April, while observe, observing the Armenian genocide, I organized a reading at Beyond Baroque in Los Angeles with Rafi Vartanian. Um, with, and other Armenian writers called Remembering, Armenian Writers Against Cur Commemoration, the idea being that we can't commemorate while genocide is active. Much of the discussion centered on the losses and crimes in Artsakh alongside those in Gaza. I also teach a writing workshop series that started in 2020 during the second Nagorno-Karabakh war called Connected Rooms for Armenian and Swana writers. And then the last thing I'll mention is I recently engaged in a dialogue with Dilar Dirik, a scholar on the Kurdish women's movement about solidarity between Kurdistan and Artsakh for the publication, The Funambulist. It became an outlet for some of my thoughts that have been brewing these past months about Palestine, about Armenia, and about the horizontal, why Armenians seem to more frequently reach above to powers that have historically oppressed us instead of across to others like us. I learned from Dilar as she expressed her vision of a liberating internationalism. As an artist and an activist, I find myself struggling with hope on an individual and collective level. How can hope connect us to disengage imperialism, capitalism, and other relentless forces 
when hope can also be co-opted by those very forces? How can we not just undo the myths of the oppressor, but also build a place like Rojava, a reality we would like to see? Even in the midst of the genocidal carnage, I find myself inspired by the will of the Palestinian people when I think about the struggles of Armenians. So I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next, we'll go to Rafi. Uh, if you would uh, introduce yourself, uh, briefly describe your family history and how that uh, history informs uh, your current response and experience of uh, what's happening in Gaza. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you. Thank you, um, Toranj. Thank you to all the uh, amazing organizers who brought us together. Um, I was saying earlier that I wish we didn't have to come together for the, for something like this, and yet I'm so grateful and and glad that that we're able to um, unite and and talk about these critical issues. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Chumash and Tongva Gabrielino indigenous people whose lands I'm learning, working and creating upon today. And I just thought I would share my my connection with the Armenian genocide uh, just by reading to you uh, my my great grandfather's account. Um, he wrote five books about his uh, survival of the genocide, but also how he got into uh, hypnotism and magnetism and road construction. And um, so this is a passage where he's um, talking about uh, being on a a farm where he was a slave uh, for four years and the different things he witnessed. Um, a trigger warning, this is a bit intense, but this is my my entry point. From 19th, and, and his name was Mardiros Balamyan. He's from Zara, which is in the Sepastia region. From 1915 to 18, during my stay at Kharaj, the farm where I was employed as a slave laborer to Muhammad Ali, the Kurdish chief, I was an eyewitness to the martyrdom of my nation. I have seen Armenians feeding on their children or devouring each other. I have seen heinous Turkish soldiers tearing milk-sucking babies from their mother's breasts, throwing them high up into the air, and then piercing them with their bayonets as they fell and hurling them back to their mothers to amuse the maddening Turkish crowds watching, watching them. I have neither the heart nor words to describe the indescribable. Now I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what would you advise me to do? If you were me, what would you do? Now in the solitude of my room and privacy of my soul, these blood curdling memories of unprecedented tortures barbarous atrocities inflicted on young maidens, women, children, milk-sucking babies, old women and men who had done nothing to deserve such a heinous punishment fill me with an irresistible feeling of wrath and vengeance to kill and destroy all those who are responsible for such inhuman deeds. All these years I have controlled myself thinking that those responsible for these atrocities has, have already died and I must not stain my hands with the blood of innocent people and become a murderer myself. On the other hand, to this day, as an old man of 85, every night I am haunted by nightmares arising from the tormented memories of these barbarous massacres inflicted on the Armenians. I remember those times of my escape, terror-stricken and mad, with the constant threat of death hanging over my head like the sword of Damocles. So uh, these are the stories that we grew up with, and um, you know, every every year uh, we would pull Mardiros's books off the shelf, and we would uh, read from them uh, on April twenty fourth. And uh, there was, and I grew up in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. That's where I'm from. My parents uh, immigrated from Lebanon, and their parents came from the indigenous Western Armenian uh, land where Armenians had lived for millennia, um, from Adana, Hajun, uh, Zara, and Kharpert, and. Um, 
every April 24th, uh, you know, in Baltimore, we were close to Washington. So there was always this hope that, you know, this might be the year that the United States recognizes the Armenian genocide and, um, you know, there would be protests organized and and um, all of this hope that somehow the United States could fix things and set the record straight. And um, it, I think it, it really, uh, it, it obviously didn't come to fruition. Eventually, pres you know, President Biden did recognize the Armenian genocide, but then months later, he he sat back as um, Azerbaijan uh, perpetrated the latest chapter of the Armenian genocide on the indigenous Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh. Um, seeing, uh, so with my grandparents um, surviving and great-grandparents surviving the Armenian genocide and my parents displaced by the Lebanese civil war um, and you know, we would visit Lebanon each summer growing up to see my grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles. And then with my brother who joined the, the U.S. Army from 2002 to 2004, uh, there's just been this ongoing engagement with state-sanctioned violence, uh, whether it's, you know, real or um, imagined. And um, especially when... I, I always struggled with the question of like, well, I, how much of the, the trauma of the genocide can I claim if I myself haven't really gone, th experienced it? Um, and it wasn't until I was older that I realized there were all these other manifestations of it, whether it was like the the PTSD that existed in my family, uh, something as simple as the fear of dogs um, or uh you know, just this idea that you can't really trust, um, you can't trust the government, or if things are safe, you can never really be sure, because everything could just turn on and turn on a dime. There's always this specter of, of death and violence. And it was always clear that we never had a rooted sense of home, because from generation to generation, we were moving from place to place. Um, so I'm very... I basically spent a lot of you know my life being confronted with the realities of state sanctioned violence and also what the denial of a genocide looks like um and the definition of genocide which I've you know read from Raphael Lemkin Holocaust survivor and from Franz Werfel who wrote the 40 days of uh, Musadagh um and so when when I see um a people who are experiencing state sanctioned violence or I see a government that is attempting to cover up or deny the reality, whether it is the reality of climate change, or it is the reality of genocide, or it is the reality of um, a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, and seeing how governments and states can twist and weaponize language and turn minorities on each other, um, it, it's abundantly clear because um, these are the stories that we were raised in, and this is the inheritance that we received. And so um, seeing what's happening to the Palestinians in Gaza, seeing what's happening to the Palestinians in the West Bank, um, and but in particular in Gaza, just the destruction and the denial, it's been really um, devastating. And so um, just to have been born into and to have intimately studied the Armenian genocide and then the broader theoretical frameworks of state sanctioned violence has really um, compelled me to try to just open my eyes and, and not do what Nancy so aptly uh, articulated, which is um, to be the kind of an American who, who forgets his history. Um, I don't want to be an American who forgets his history, and I think that we can do much better than that. And so remembering my history as an Armenian and with the, the history of America, I'm, I try to look at the situation in, in Palestine and recognize that, um, you know, what we're seeing is uh, a state-sanctioned violence and, and a, a degree of denial and revisionism that is utterly devastating. And... I'm it's 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 just heartbreaking and um I I just don't know what to do and so I'm just grateful that we can be here together
Thank you, Rafi. Uh, if you're just tuning in, this is session number six of 24 Hours for Palestine on Toran Jigazarian. Uh, next, we're going to Savan, our next panelist. Go ahead, Savan, and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, everyone. My name is Savan. I'm a writer and performer based out of Brooklyn, New York, which is on the unceded lands of the Muncie Lenape. Um, I <laughs> so I was born and raised in Kuwait. My grandmother is um, my connection to the Armenian genocide. She was five years old when she was um, found and rescued by a Bedouin tribe in eastern Armenia. Um, she remembered very little of her family outside of the fact that she had nine brothers and sisters and her father's first name and there being a massive tree in the village, which if all the villagers stood around it would not be able to join hands in a complete circle. Um, she was then uh, forcibly taken by Christian missionaries from the Bedouin tribe and put into uh, one of the two major um, refugee orphanages in Beirut, um, which is where she ended up growing up, meeting her husband, who was also a survivor of the genocide. My uh, mother and my aunt were born and raised there, as were my cousins. They also contended with the Lebanese Civil War and the displacement of that, although my grandmother stayed until far longer than she needed to in Beirut um, during wartime. I myself am a war refugee from the Second Gulf War. That's how I, how I ended up in America, in Florida, of all places. And um, on my father's side, uh, I'm this interesting mix of South Asian and Armenian, which people think is very foreign, but historically there have been Armenian villages in the Indian subcontinent for uh, far, far longer than anyone actually um, believes and considers. And so my connection is also to the genocide that happened during the 1947 partition. Uh, growing up, I knew very little about my grandmother's history. Um, my family was of the branch of diasporic Armenians that decided not to speak about the trauma so as to not visit it upon the children and the grandchildren. Um, and it wasn't much later until I was an adult that I was able to get information out of my mother, my aunt, and my cousin. My grandmother never spoke about it. I never heard about it directly from her mouth. I never even had uh, the courage to ask her. So, uh, and most of the information we have is, again, quite limited because she was quite young. I didn't really start exploring my connection to the genocide until I moved to New York and started working as a professional actor. And specifically when I started writing, uh, the very first play I ever wrote was called Forgotten Bread, which was about uh, sort of different scenes um, from the Armenian genocide. And that's when I sort of did a deep dive. And as most people know, when you deep dive into your epigenetic trauma, um, it brings up a whole bunch of histories that is uh, heartrending and strangely uh, also satisfying because then you start to understand who you are in the larger tapestry of things. And I started to understand my own experience as a war refugee within that. Um, and when this round of fighting and war um, happened in Palestine, um, I remember being very frozen and stuck and I was in the middle of writing my first uh, novel and thought to myself, I don't know how to continue doing this. Um, in the theater, there's sort of a, a huge anti-Palestinian, anti-MENA movement currently in which many artists are being blacklisted, canceled, so on and so forth. So I sort of felt very silenced by that and, and was lucky enough to have a book agent who encouraged me because in, in the publishing world, there isn't that same sentiment of stopping these voices for the most part. Um, my journey to understanding Palestinian politics wasn't until I went to Jerusalem to visit um, the old Armenian quarters there, because growing up in the Middle East, talking about Palestine was sort of very hush-hush. I actually knew nothing about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict until I came to America. Um, in fact, when I was posting things about the recent conflict, my mother reached out and told me to shut up. Um, because there was still this idea of don't speak about it, it's not your business, don't get involved in it. And I actually learned all my anti-Zionist, pro-Palestinian politics from former IDF members in Jerusalem. So my entry into that politics wasn't through my Armenian relatives or through my American friends or even through my Arab friends. And I vividly remember in the second month thinking to myself, once all the denial started happening, and obviously I'm no stranger to genocide denial, but watching it happen live 
I vividly remember wondering what my grandmother must have thought when, during the genocide, global media was acknowledging it and was supporting our people and was talking about it. And then to very quickly shut up about it and deny it, I can only imagine what that must have felt like for her. And so to watch sort of the same rhetoric, like saying photos were faked, videos are faked, there's crisis actors, I was struck by the level of inhumanity and deniability about genocide events. And this is not obviously unique to Armenians. It's not unique to Palestinians. This tends to happen in almost every single genocide that gets recognized and unrecognized. This idea that how can a species be this inhumane, leaving aside obviously the politics of it all. And I and it was it was sobering. It was eye awakening. It made me feel even more responsible to want to speak up and to keep speaking up. And then, of course, it became very personal when Israel started getting involved in southern Lebanon because um, I am a quarter Lebanese and those are my people. To see them be affected by it again um, was uh, deeply painful. Then to also see Israel's involvement with supporting Azerbaijan, what was going on with, with Artsakh, it was sort of like, okay, so all my peoples right now are are contending with this event directly or on the um, on the sidelines. Um, so I've I've I have felt now more than ever a responsibility to, to write about this, and it actually helped it helped me get through the novel and to write the novel and actually helped me better understand Palestinian politics in Lebanon, especially during the civil war, um, in a way that my family never spoke about, refused to speak about, and in a way that I never really truly understood. I never quite understood how deeply ingrained Palestinians and Armenians were during the Civil War and when Palestinians were coming into Lebanon. Um, and it makes me even angry now, sort of, that some Lebanese people, some other Middle Eastern countries, even some Armenians, refuse to support and acknowledge it, sometimes out of selfishness of, well, no one supports and recognizes us, so how can we do that for someone else? And in in my opinion, if we are the only ones who understand what each other is going through. And if we don't support one another, then I don't know who will, because certainly those in power will not, and they do not. Um, and I think it's so important that all these countries and cultures, all artists from all disciplines have a responsibility to to speak up in some way, shape, or form, um, to acknowledge it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, because the reality is, is, as most of us know, those of us who are uh, epigenetic inheritors of the genocide, this trauma doesn't go away. It doesn't stop. There's an expiration date on it. It sort of is constantly there um, and felt in ways that uh, I don't know how for how many more generations because it's we've never really had an endpoint of it. And I'm not sure if it would go away even after acknowledgement. Um, because there is sort of certainly a lot of repair work to be done there. Uh, so that's um that's my connection to the politics. That's my connection as a as an artist and as uh, someone who is both a, a survivor of war and as someone who is so deeply ingrained in in living in the research of it and the experience of it. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Saban. Um, we now move to Oji Yeratian. If you would introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your personal history. Um, and then I know that you uh, led a, a dialogue group, Armenian-Turkish dialogue group, for some time. If you would also talk about that. Thank you, Oji. Hello, everyone. My name is Oji Gyaretsian. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am zooming in from the unceded Ohlone land of Pinole, California. And I, um, before I even knew my family's story of genocide survival, I was at the annual protests in Los Angeles chanting, 1915, never again. Turkey, back to Mongolia. 1915, never again. Turkey, back to Mongolia. As a child, um, I grew up in this thick um, East Hollywood Armenian community in the 1970s and 80s, where my whole world was Armenian. 
I went to Armenian day school. My father and uncle ran an Armenian publishing company and a bookstore. I went to Armenian dance classes and had a large network of cousins and friends, all Armenian. And I'm not sure what children are taught now in Armenian schools, but in those days, we were taught to hate the Turks. My family didn't amplify that message at home, but I did develop it in my heart. I feared Turks, Turkey, anything Turkish, including fruit and household items. Um, when I left high school and joined the multi-ethnic world of college, my first friend was Palestinian. Uh, Mustafa shared that his grandmother still had the key to their home in Palestine. He was my entree to this occupation in this part of the world. His business, he had a business card, I don't know why. It, it read homeless, stateless, penniless. And I felt a connection. There was, it was, there was, we were kindred spirits. Uh, I didn't meet a Kurdish student until much later. And I held my breath as we shook hands. I was filled with shame for being disloyal to the Armenian community. And my ancestors are rolling in their graves. And I also felt a lot of fear, like he had a bayonet in his backpack and would attack if I wasn't hyper vigilant. Uh, years later, I learned my uh, family history. So my mother's side of the family is from, my great grandparents were from Urfa, Darson, and made their way through the genocide, being conscripted into the army or the, the national forces. And then my great grandfather ended up fleeing in a gross situation um, and made it to Damascus, where he met my great grandmother, who had also fled. Um, my grandmother's father received notice from, he was like a city planner or like a, a, a chief architect of Darson, and he received notice from a Turkish person saying, bad stuff is about to happen, you should flee. And they got their family, the women and children, out to Damascus. That's where they met and then started their family. My father's side of the family, eerily similar. Uh, there was a oud player on the on my father's side of the family, the Adanas, my family's from Adana, and he played for one of the Pashas and heard in that milieu that some horrible stuff is about to happen, notify your family. And so my father's side fled to Beirut and somehow my parents moved to LA and that's where I was born. Um, years later, I don't know how much more time I have, Toronto, I'm going to keep going. In Berkeley, I learned, uh, when I was in Berkeley, I learned of Palestinian, Jewish, Arab, Israeli dialogue efforts. And I thought, wow, if they could handle sitting across from each other in the same room, having difficult conversations, maybe so could we. Um, I was also part of another living room dialogue um, process that focused on race, racism, and ethnicity. There was a Turkish person in there as well, and I was too afraid to bring up 1915 with her for fearing the sting of denial. I didn't think I had what it took to sit face to face and someone tell me that didn't happen to your people. You know, and I and I grew up with all those images through school of like those famished bodies of those bony people of the stories of for example what Rafi shared about the his his 
great grandfathers, eyewitness accounts, and to see those now on in Gaza, to to hear people are looking for grass to eat and finding leather shoes to eat is just gut wrenching for me. So I I I'm here to say that yes, there's the political realm to the devastation that's occurring right now. There's the there's also the emotional and spiritual level. And tapping underneath the hate to acknowledge the pain is I think how we address the legacy of trauma that we have inherited. And um, for example, when my friend Mustafa learned that I was dating a Jewish guy, he said, it's okay, Oj, we're cousins, we're Canaanites. And I want to bring forth that spirit of neighborliness, of belonging, of kinship, and common humanity with all those who need it. That's how I want to show up in the world. So this dialogue group with Turks and Armenians, really briefly, it was called Opening the Mountain. We launched with the help of a drama therapist, uh, Armand Volkas, who led the Healing the Wounds of History project. And we had a day long, we, rec we recruited Turkish participants, Armenian participants, and we had a playback session in the evening, which made public the stories that were shared during the day. And it was very intense. And then after that, in 2004, we started meeting on a monthly basis in someone's home in the Bay Area. And we have had anywhere from 20 to 25 participants at our height to like 10 people uh, more recently. Since COVID, we've turned into a book club um on zoom but we have we have formed a community an alternative community where people's personal experiences family histories histories are made visible acknowledged validated heard there have been spontaneous apologies there have been many many tears and a lot of it took a lot of trust and respect to be built as a foundation in order for these stories to emerge. And I'm I'm proud of that. And I wanted to stop there. Thank you, Jake. And I think you have an image that you want to share with us. Yes. Uh, do we have that image? Can we show it? Thank you. Yeah, my cousin from Los Angeles, Arno Yeretsian, just sent this to me. He received it yesterday. I'll read it. It says, from Armenian to Palestine, genocide is a crime. Hayastanitz Pavestin Tsevas Banutuna Hansanke. And the second sticker reads, Gazaitz Minchev Artsakh, Azadakrum Hima. Hamerash Utun and Misht. Those are state statements of solidarity in yes. Armenian. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ajit, for, for, for sharing that. Um it 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 so now we move into a sort of a group conversation. Everybody feel free to just jump in. But uh one of the things that um I was reminded of um uh, back in, you know, end of October, November of last year was that, you know, the, the U.S. doesn't really have much of a moral ground to stand on in this, uh, in, in this situation, because, of course, the country uh, has a colonial history. There is a history of genocide of the, the indigenous population and then nation building on the backs of slaves and and immigrants even to this day. So and we've talked about state sanctioned violence. We've talked about sort of mass denial. Um, so so in that context, uh, what does never again actually mean for us? It's uh, it's it's intentionally a big question because I want you to sort of respond to it from wherever you are and and just jump in 
whoever's ready to uh, to speak. Go ahead, Nancy. You you look like you want to speak. Go ahead. I was just going to jump off of something that Sevan had said uh, um, about those, and, and I can't remember the context, but those people, I think you were talking about Beirut and, and that um, we all have a responsibility and that the people among us um, understand and get what we've been through as Armenians and we have a responsibility to do the same. I think we do feel the same, but maybe we don't always act. Um, I wanted to briefly mention um, Yala, the, the organization I mentioned before. We actually did an event in September 2023. It was right before the ethnic cleansing happened um, to call attention to the blockade. And it was very heartening when we made a call for poets to join us, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, Afghan, Cambodian, Kurdish, and Palestinian writers all participated or recorded videos. And um, I think there is that feeling of no one cares about us. And so to have an event like that is a reminder that no, we do, we are cared about and, and people do remember. And I think, you know, it obligates us to do the same. Um, and I think you know, in an Armenian, I operate a lot in an Armenian American context. And so I, I wish that our organizations would be more vocal. I feel we're reluctant. I mean, we're reliant on small grassroots organizations like Yerezad Coalition and Armor Coalition. And this very event, that um, the speaking out happens on a small scale with people who don't have a lot of resources. And I just feel it behooves people who've found more strength and power um, to remember where they came from. I think we're all victims of denial in some way. And Taranj, I appreciated what you said about how we can't expect the, um, the US government to act given its history. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I, I, I have <laughs> I've grown to have such an issue with that phrase never again, because I think now it's sort of flippantly used very easily by a lot of people without understanding the context of that phrase. And I think especially because it's couched in a very specific event, it um it often uh feels co-optive. And I think for me, what I run into more so than any, more than anything else is the fact that just just a lack of education, a lack of understanding history. And I think without that, saying never again becomes sort of hollow and becomes equivalent to putting a black square during the BLM movement by people who didn't understand the history of, of that movement and how it came about. Um, I mean, obviously, like all of us inherently agree that genocide should not happen again. Um, but I think as long as we don't teach these histories, understand these histories, um, that it is going to keep happening again. Um, and it's hard, it's hard sometimes to do that in a, in, in a sphere in which politics and capitalism hold so much sway over knowledge. And uh, those who have the knowledge are often shut down. So I think my fight 
individually more than anything else is about educating people and continuing to educate myself because there's some stuff that I still don't know as well. And there's a lot of stuff that I get wrong as well because the history, and not just Armenian, the Palestinian uh, situation as well, like in the Lebanese situation, everything that's a part of my culture, there's so much that has been kept from us and hidden from us that the excavation is constant. And I think we have to keep that excavation going and involve people in it, both those who come from that um, epigenetic DNA and those who don't and who do want to learn and who do want to understand all these histories outside of just reposting something on social media and hashtagging it. Yeah. Um, I, for me, never again um, was for the first time a slogan that I heard at the um, Armenian genocide demonstrations that uh, Ojig was referring to in California. I'm from the East Coast and I would hear it um, being, uh, you know, chanted at the Turkish embassy and on the other side of the street were counter protesters basically shouting the same message back. Um, and it was just always a very kind of uncomfortable, um, difficult environment for me. Uh, and I didn't really know what to do with that. I often felt powerless saying the words uh, never again when the very like deny the, the language of denial was being shouted back at me. And I just found myself unable to really do make anything useful of that. So um, what I've eventually landed on is this idea that never again is ultimately a call to action. Um, it's an ideal, but I think it's also a call to action. And so um, I think it's really important to, as, as Sevan was saying, to create um, opportunities and ways for people to get engaged, to learn, uh, to constantly excavate for ourselves, uh, not just for our own histories, but because of all these different um, genocides and atrocities that have happened, there's all these interconnected, like interconnected challenges, even the history of the Palestinians in Lebanon, from the Nakba, they came into Lebanon, and the Lebanese didn't let them get citizenship. So they were waiting in refugee camps until they could try to return to Palestine, but that day never really came. Um, and so the sort of conflict between Palestine and Israel was happening across a border. And um, you know, in, in the spirit of education, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of great books on this, but I think um, uh, Robert Fisk's Pity the Nation is one really great uh, book book on that. Um, and I'd love to be able to share in the spirit of education, like voices, sources who have a lot of great things to say. Um, so, so for me, it's a call to action and, um, you know, similar to, uh, so when I was first living in Southern California, um, I tried to organize, I organized a reading uh, between Armenian and uh, indigenous tribes during the time of the Standing Rock um, Dakota Access Pipeline protests, just to try to um, orchestrate dialogue and conversation between the shared history between uh, Armenians and who are an indigenous people who are displaced from their land and the um, indigenous tribes of the Americas who have obviously faced a similar history. Um, and then uh, years later, similar to Ojig, I, I also um, created this project called Letters for Peace, where we uh, worked with youth in Armenia and Azerbaijan to um, at the intersection of creative writing and conflict transformation to tr to uh, exchange letters and facilitate dialogue between, um, as Nancy was saying, in a horizontal rather than a vertical spirit to try to foster dialogue in an environment where um, the borders are closed, people are being separated, and often it's because of what governments and militaries are imposing upon people who have a rich history of living together side by side. So often these conflicts are um, manufactured manifestations of um, what political elites are using to profit off of the, the militarization of these uh, differences and discrepancies between people who have so much in common. Um, and then most recently, I organized something in uh, this past April called Poets Against Genocide, a commemorative solidarity reading um, here in Glendale. So we had uh, Armenian, Turkish, uh, Palestinian, Jewish, uh, Ukrainian, um, Taiwanese, Mexican, all sorts of writers who were coming together in the spirit of um, speaking out against 
the the violence of genocide that we're seeing to, today being perpetrated with impunity, not, uh, of course, first and foremost upon the people in Gaza, but also for anyone who dares to speak out, as Sevan was saying, facing the silencing and the doxing. Um, so for me personally, I've been teaching at UCLA now. I teach writing there. It's been three years. Um, what, what we saw on campuses across America and specifically at UCLA was extremely disturbing. Um, police were brought in to dismantle a peaceful encampment and um, student protesters were arrested uh, at, in an effort to keep the, um, the keep the campus safe that was rendered violent because um, extremist supporters of this extremist regime in um, in Israel came in and were throwing um, fireworks into the the anti-war encampment and they were releasing mice into the encampment. This is happening in America. And so um, it's it's just been, so we talk about lack of education and we talk and what Nancy was saying, this idea of like in America, we're constantly being uh, programmed to forget, you know, forget, forget, forget. And so I think um, for me, never again is really a call to action to remember, to educate, organize, um, create resources, create opportunities, however we can, um, and, and not to internalize what happens when um, institutions, whether they're you know cultural or political institutions, don't have the the wherewithal or the backbone to call you know just to to be truthful and to be forthright and to stand up for people's basic human rights. Uh, just really quickly, springboarding off of that, I would say the phrase should be um, never again. But you know, in Armenian, we say "hishemisht," never forget. And I think really that phrase carries a lot more power than never again, because never again leaves room for memory loss. And never forget means you must remember and you must keep this going. Not to live in the trauma necessarily, but to keep the histories told and spoken and carried forward through the generations. Thank you, Rafi and Savan. Ojik, did you want to jump in and add anything? The only thing I would add is um, ne never again uh, seems protective and like cons consoling or comforting, maybe not consoling, comforting. But in fact, it it is disturbing for me. It's another wall. Uh, it's like a, the, uh, I went to... Jerusalem last year and saw the apartheid wall. I saw how Armenians are being treated in Jerusalem as well. Uh, through dialogue efforts, I've heard about how Istanbul Armenians are treated, also a second-class citizen, similar to how Palestinians are treated. And I think, never forget, uh, Sevan is, I could get behind that too. Um, I think it's, it's it's clear to me, like as we're tying in the indigenous uh, histories of Anatolia, of the U.S., of Palestine, that like, um, or it, it will, yeah. Anyway, I don't want to leave on a negative note. I'll just stop. no. Go ahead, finish your thought. Go ahead. Don't don't self censor. I think I've just been taking a lot of deep breaths during this session. I've needed to just like ground myself and calm myself and soothe. So I just want to end by thanking and uh, to my fellow panelists, to Torange for Golden Thread, for the um, solidarity and the call for horizontal having each other's backs. Nancy, thank you for sharing that. And um, that's it. Thank you. Um, so solidarity and allyship is, of course, very important. I know that uh, at Golden Thread, we take that very seriously. And in that spirit, the next session uh, is actually going to be about the Afghan community and allyship with that community. And because we talked about the indigenous communities in the U.S., 
Um, I also want to mention that the session number 20, so 7.30 a.m. Pacific time, that is a panel by Indigenous artists talking about um, their history and their actions and, um, uh, and you know, the ongoing spirit and resilience, uh, which is so necessary to, to all of our communities. Um, also, call to action, I believe 24 hours uh, for Palestine will actually end with a call to action. Uh, and I want to give a shout out also at 7.30, I'll be uh, facilitating a second session. Don't get sick of me. I'm sorry. I apologize. But that one it, it involves a play reading and specifically focuses on the role of art and artists uh, during, uh, during, you know, times of genocide, which is, you know, it, I think it's easy to fall into this sort of um, hopelessness and and um, and um, kind of a nihilistic uh, uh, view. Um, and I, I sometimes remind myself, uh, you know, I have to remind myself that I don't really, um, I, I don't, you know, so many people don't have that luxury that they're they're surviving, and they're surviving through. Uh, much harsher reality than me in my suburban comfortable home. Uh, and so, um, you know, that forces me to, get, you know, uh, get myself up again. Um, we do have five more minutes to talk. And I, I, on that sort of note, what, what gives you energy to, to keep going uh, Rafi, I'm going to guess that your son gives you energy, but you you tell me. Yeah. Yes, he he gives me energy. Sometimes he takes energy away. You know, it depends on his how he's doing, but mostly he gives me energy. Um, you know, what what gives me energy is uh, all of you. Um, all of the, I mean, Torange, you've inspired me for so many years. The work that you've been doing with Golden Thread. Um, Nancy, when I read your book for the first time, I was so inspired and that energized me. Sevan, when I when I met you in the New York Writers Group and saw what you were writing, I was so inspired and energized. Um, when I look at nature, um, when I look at a, a mountain or an ocean, um, I'm energized. But ultimately, you know, it's it's like I know that if I, as you were saying, Toranj, if I give up, if I be, if I ultimately become hopeless and nihilistic and just try to disconnect and detach that's when the genocide is complete or that's when the the erasure and the violence has completely um achieved its purpose um and i just kn knowing what my ancestors have been through you know re having received their stories seeing what um, what war does to people and to families. You know, when my brother was in the army, uh, it was a, a torture every single day. You don't know, is he going to be sent to fight? Is he not going to be sent to fight? We don't agree with this war. He does. Like, what What does this all mean? Um, so it it's, I think war war is designed to really crush the human spirit. And I think war is um, often something that is imposed by people who are not willing to fight in the wars that they create. Um, and I've often said, like, if if there's a you know a dictator or a ruler in the world somewhere who really believes in their war, let them go fight on the front lines and let's see if they really believe in it. Um, so I'm energized by all the different amazing creative people who who are grappling with these issues in different ways and also it energized by the the spirit of human resilience um that we're seeing with the children and the elderly people and just the innocent people uh of gaza um and the innocent armenian people of Artsakh who are displaced um and you know all the people who are trying to um speak a truth in the face of silencing doxing uh, appropriation, doppelganging, all the twisted rhetorical maneuvers that are being used to silence us. I'm inspired by the by the um, forces that are speaking out. Thank you, Rafi. Nancy, I want to give you uh, the final minute of our of uh, of our session, and then I'll introduce the next session. The 
Go ahead, Nancy. Just quickly, I think um, connecting with people. I'm a teacher, I'm a caregiver, and I'm a friend. And it's um, in those relationships where the truth can be told. Um, and that's what keeps me going. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, Sevan, Oje, Graffi. Uh, thank you for your fighting spirit and for your clarity of vision. I, I really appreciate you. Thank you for your time and your sharing your talents with us. Um, I have the honor of now introducing the next session, Shared Struggles and Resilience, moderated my, by my good friend, uh, Homaira Kalzai, and it really builds on uh, this idea of building solidarity across communities. Thank you all.